impermanent and ever-changing forms unobstructedly interpenetrate the permanent and immutable formlessness. <laughs> Podcast, episode 215, Shingon 1. So, okay, so this is the first episode of a whole new playlist, a whole new project within Buddhist Books Podcast. And I've talked about it before, but for the people who've just joined briefly, on all the episodes that end one through four or six through nine, we're doing pre-sectarian early Buddhism in the form of the Tipitaka, which is behind me. And eventually, you know, we'll work our way up to Mahayana and then the uh, Theravadan monks that came after early Mahayana and codified modern Theravada. And then, uh, yeah, so on the episodes that end in zero, like 200, 210, 220, we do uh, Tibetan Vajrayana in the form of the life and liberation of Padmasambhava. And sometimes, randomly, we get into Zen or Chan. And uh, today is the very first episode where we're getting into Japanese Vajrayana. In other words, Shingon. And uh, I'm going to begin reading this big brick of a book called The Matrix and Diamond World Mandalas in Shingon Buddhism. Now, I, I don't really know much about this book. I don't know how much of it is like a, a translation of Japanese scriptures into English and how much of it is just someone having done research explaining things. We're going to find out together. This book was not easy to get, and, uh, but I've got it, and I'm going to share it with you. And I am about to find out. There's a whole bunch of different sections, and uh, you know, there's a long table of contents, but rather than reading the table of contents, rather than reading the preface, I am going to get directly to part one. Prolego Menon, Esoteric Doctrine and Practice. Prolego Menon. Maybe that's in the title of this episode. I don't know. Okay. One. One again. So this could be part one, section one, chapter one, part one. One, one, one. One of one of one. Here we go. The characteristics of the esoteric doctrine. The tantric school of Japanese Buddhism is called Shingon, meaning true word. Or else Mikyo, esoteric doctrine. All right. Briefly, briefly. Um, his name was Kukai. Uh, he's known post-mortem as Kobodayashi. And uh, this banner, this Kake Jiku, or hanging banner, on my right, which I believe is your left, if I'm not mistaken, um, I'm not sure if it's 100% Shingon, but I know that this right here, hopefully something's popping up on the screen, um, is a, it's a Goshwin. Goshwin meaning red stamp. Um, each temple has its own unique signature or stamp that they give. You, you can go around with a little book with blank pages and they'll put the Goshwin in there when you visit the temple, usually with a small donation. Um, or else if you're going on a pilgrimage of many temples, then you might get a blank scroll like this one and then go from temple to temple getting the Goshwin of that temple. Now, uh, disclaimer, I did not 
go on these pilgrimages. These pilgrimages were gone on by the parents of a dear friend of mine who donated or gave these, uh, these banners to me to hang in my temple room when I was living back in California. And when I shifted from California to India, I brought them with me. Anyway, so I believe this one up here, uh, the translation is something to the effect of Kobo Dayashi is still alive. He is in the cave behind the temple meditating. He is meditating in the cave behind the temple, something like that. Um, the, uh, the, the temple meaning the, the old temple in uh, the older one, the older of the 14 temples in uh, Mount Koyasan in Japan. And uh, that's, that's where he established Shingon in 815 Common Era. And uh, so there you go. Okay. Just, just a little brief, brief thing. Okay. <clears throat> Referring not to secret teachings that are only revealed to qualified initiates, but to the hidden and profound nature of the referent of the teachings which is the inner realization, or naisho, of the Supreme Buddha, Maha Vairokana Tathagata. Do we have, well, he's over there. I don't think I have a Vairokana right here. Anyway, um, this realization is deep, mysterious, and esoteric because it can only be understood in states of samadhi. All right, so you and I are going to read about it, but we'll never understand it. I mean, you know, unless we reach a state of samadhi. One can hope, right? Okay. <clears throat> the founder of the Shingon school, Kobo Dayashi, or Kukai, uh, defines the distinguishing characteristics of esoteric Buddhism by way of a twofold analysis an analysis in breadth, which arranges the esoteric and exoteric Buddhist teachings into horizontally differentiated divisions, and an analysis in depth, which arranges them into a vertically differentiated hierarchy of ten stages of mind. A. So this is one, one, 1a. The analysis in breadth. To show the differences between exoteric and esoteric Buddhism, and I would like to note that esoteric is lowercase, or rather es exoteric, meaning not esoteric, right? E esoteric is for the few, exoteric is for the many. Mm. So there you go. Nobody uses the word exoteric except for the esoteric, right? Anyway, but exoteric is um, lowercase and esoteric is capitalized. Anyway, okay. <clears throat> to show the differences between exoteric and esoteric Buddhism, Kobo Dayashi compares the teachings of four Mahayana schools. Kigon, and then it says Avalotisaka. I really need reading glasses. Tendai, that's the one I'm always trying to remember, uh, or Tiendai, Hoso, Vijnanavada, and San, Sanrom, Madhyamika. I assume that's related to Madhyamaka. Okay. With the corresponding esoteric doctrines, he shows that they differ in five major ways. Whoo wee one, or more fully, Himmitsu Bukyo, esoteric Buddhist doctrine. The significance of the term Shingon, <clears throat> true word, is given below on page 45. Oh, it's one of these kinds of books. All right. Two, Shingon, as, oh, these are footnotes. Oh, they're the same size as the regular text, so I was a little confused. 
I'm going to go ahead and keep reading the regular text, and uh, I'll only refer to the footnotes when I'm really confused and need to check the footnotes. Okay, so back to what he's saying. He shows, by he I mean Adrian Snodgrass, very unusual Japanese surname, Snodgrass. No, he's clearly not Japanese. So, yeah, like I said, I like to try to stick to English translations of scriptures, but I'm making an exception because I've only got two books on Shingon, and this one seems more impressive than the other one. So, that's, that's what it is. If anybody out there is an expert on Shingon and has a good recommendation for some Shingon scripture that I might find in English that I can order in India, preferably, uh, please comment below. All right, continuing. One, these are the five ways that the, the, those Mahayana schools differ from each other, I think. <clears throat> One, the Dharma body is the doctrine lord. Firstly, the teachings differ concerning the identity of the doctrine lord. The Buddha who preaches the sutras. The exoteric schools say that the doctrine lord is Shakyamuni. Okay, Shakyamuni, of course, is another name for Lord Buddha, um, as in Lord Buddha who started the original Sangha, the Tipitaka behind me, being the record of the rules, the teachings, and the higher doctrine of the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. And as anybody who's read the first page of uh, the Lotus Sutra, or I assume other Mahayana Sutras, I haven't really dove into Mahayana yet, but as anybody who's looked at them and read just a little bit about when they were written and so on can tell you, they're not, they're not from that same Lord Buddha. Not to say they're not valid, um, but if what you're looking for is the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, it's not the Mahayana Sutra. So I'm going to go ahead and agree with, uh, with Kobayashi on this one. Okay. The Buddha who preached the Dharma in India. They reach that reverent, they reach that reward body. They teach, even better, they teach that the reward body preaches the doctrine of the one vehicle, for the sake of the bodhisattvas who are the superior sages in the 52 bodhisattva stages and the, co the correspondence body, which is the body of Shakyamuna, Shakyamuni, preaches the doctrines of the two vehicles and the three vehicles for the sake of mankind, for Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas, and for the Bodhisattvas who are in the prior stages of the 52 Bodhisattva stages. The third and highest of the, Bodhi, of the Buddha bodies, the Dharma body, does not preach the Dharma because it is wholly transcendent. It is suchness identified with voidness and the principle of formlessness and therefore cannot preach the, dhar the Dharma because this would involve the use of words which belong to the realm of forms. All right, I like it so far. Um, generally speaking, uh, the reason why we're focusing eight out of ten episodes on um, Theravada or Tipitaka pre-sectarian early Buddhism is because I'm going with the advice of many people that you want to lay the foundation first and the foundation is Theravada or the teachings of Lord Buddha and then later if you choose to you can build the first story the ground floor of the house upon that foundation and that's Mahayana and then if you've got that strong the foundation is strong, the house is strong. Then, then, and only then, maybe. I mean, some folks don't follow this advice and that's, they're free to do that. But the advice I'm following is then, 
after you fully integrated and understood and embodied Mahayana Buddhism, then you can move on to that second story, as we say in America, or first floor, as they say in India. Never mind. The, the, the second level, right, which is uh, Vajrayana. Um, yeah, and uh, just in this first paragraph that we've read here, it's like going real fast through a bunch of Mahayana stuff that I'm like, oh, really? Okay, mm-hmm, right. I didn't know that. It's part of that sounds familiar. And so generally, that's what we're doing is I'm going to spend 10 years or so on Theravada, then another 10 years or so on Mahayana, and then really dive into Vajrayana. But because this book has just been sitting there looking tempting, and because occasionally, um, you know, to spice things up here on Buddhist Books Podcast, but also to spice things up on my own path, because there's only so many rules that you can read before you start to kind of go mad. Well, you know, um, it's, a slow, it's a slow progress, because I'm reading about a half an hour every few days of the Tipitaka, so it's taken me two years to get through these three books. And so, yeah, it's going to take a while to get through it. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I really understand what I'm reading, but I'm reading it, and I, I hope you enjoy it. And before I bore you to death with just my rambling, I'll continue reading, and I hope one day I understand all this. Okay. Esoteric Buddhism. By contrast, okay, contrast with all of that, Mahayana, which we haven't gotten to yet, right, okay. Esoteric Buddhism, by contrast, teaches that it is precisely the Dharma body that preaches the Dharma, and not the reward body or the correspondence body. The Dharma is preached not by Shakyamuni's correspondence body, but by Mahavirokana's Dharma body. Okay. I'll, I'll keep reading. The various modes of form are an aspect of ultimate reality, impermanent and ever-changing forms unobstructedly interpenetrate the permanent and immutable formlessness. Wow. I want to read that again. I don't know if I'll understand it anymore upon the second reading. I just really like that line. I'm going to read it again. Impermanent and ever-changing forms unobstructedly interpenetrate the permanent and immutable formlessness. Hmm. I want to memorize that and just kind of say it to myself over and over while I'm falling asleep. That's a good one. Since the body, excuse me, since the Dharma body is inseparable from form, it is able to reveal itself in formal modes and is able to preach the Dharma. Mahavirokana's Dharma body of form adopts innumerable forms to preach the doctrine of the three mysteries, the Dharma gate of his inner realization to the innumerable species of beings throughout the 3,000 great chillocosms, chiliocosms. What? Okay, I'm going to have to check out the footnote for chiliocosms. That's C-H-I-L-I-O, cosms, one word. Okay, one tradition recorded in Kobodayashi's Kongo Chogyo Kaidai says that all the Dharma bodies preach both the esoteric and exoteric sutras, while another, given in Fumbetsu Shai Ikyo says that the self nature Dharma body, or Jisho Hoshin, and the Dharma body of self enjoyment, G, oh, I'll skip the trying to pronounce the Japanese phonetic, preach the esoteric sutras, and the Dharma body of enjoyment for others, 
the transformation dharma body and the equal emanation dharma body preach the exoteric sutras. These types of dharma body are described below in chapter 15. Below? Was all of this written like on a long piece of paper? Just a long hanging banner? And chapter 15 is below chapter 1 somewhere? And also, how does that footnote help me understand chiliocosm? Wow, we've got a new vocab word. Let's put it up on the board. Chiliocosm. Hey, Editor Edward, can you give us any insight as to the meaning of the word chiliocosm? Chiliocosm. Noun. From the Greek uh, chilioi, chilioi, meaning thousand, and cosmos, meaning world. A collection of many worlds. Uh, a usage notes, it says here, some texts adapt this traditional Buddhist concept to modern astronomy, where the worlds are solar systems, and hence the chiliocosm is a galaxy. Uh, afterthought, Editor Edward here. Um, usually when it comes to Greek-derived words, that start with C-H, as in chrome, C-H-R-O-M-E, the C-H um, is pronounced K. So it looks like chiliocosm, but it's probably more like kiliocosm. Oh, kilo, oh. Thank you, Editor Edward. Now you, who are watching this, know the meaning of that. I, who am in the past, compared to Editor Edward, who is in my future, but in your past, I got lost. I'm sorry. I, I still don't know what chiliocosm is, but I will one day. When I'm Editor Edward, I'll find out. And when I'm you, I will already know. I think something like that. Never mind. I'll keep reading. Mahavirachana reveals the form of Yama to act as the doctrine lord in the world of hungry ghosts. <sighs> okay. He manifests the form of Maha Chakra to preach in the heaven of the 33 gods and in this manner reveals a doctrine lord to preach the esoteric doctrine in each of the innumerable worlds in the ten directions. Okay, so that's one of the five ways that Mahayana is different from itself. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. This is fun. Are you having fun? I'm having fun. Um, I was going to say something, but I lost it. I guess I'll just keep reading. <clears throat> Two, Buddhahood is not ineffable. Quite a statement there. Oh yeah, I was just going to say, um, I'm pretty sure most Tibetan Buddhists agree, but certainly Shingon Buddhists, if they say, you know, if, if you who are not Shingon Buddhist were to go to Mount Khoyasan, and say, oh yeah, I, I'm pretty familiar with Vajrayana. My dad raised me Tibetan Buddhist. <laughs> Just hypothetically, if you were to say that, then anybody that you spoke to and said that uh, would be very quick to clarify that Shingon is not the same as Tibetan Buddhism. But I suspect that they're more alike than they would like to admit. Because Kobodayashi, also known as Kukai, brought the teachings he got from his Vajrayana guru, who he met in China in around 800, and the Vajrayana Tantras, or the scriptures, what they call sutras in Mahayana, they call Tantras in Vajrayana, I think, right? Or Vajrayana. Anyway, he, he brought all of that to Japan, and that was presumably 
the same or very close to the same teachings and scriptures that were brought by folks such as Padmasambhava and uh, Vimala Mitra behind me to Tibet. And Vimala Mitra, according to legend, um, after he went to Tibet and helped them translate the, uh, the, the Vajrayana teachings into Tibetan, continued on into China and helped them translate them into Chinese. And then Kukai came and brought the Chinese version back to Japan and taught it in Japanese. So, yeah, whatever differences there are between Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism and Japanese Vajrayana Buddhism are differences that came to be after the teachings arrived in those places. Um, having come from places like Nalanda University um, in Bihar, in, in India, and other parts of India where Vajrayana was being taught before it was wiped out by the Mughals and their predecessors who came down from Afghanistan and were um, threatened by an elaborate system with universities of uh, spiritual teachings that were different from their own. It's sad. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and, and, and play a, a little clip here from m me wearing different clothes, uh, reciting from my dad's book, my dad, John Dan Reed, who taught me Buddhism when I was young. So it's like a full circle here. And uh, he once wrote in his book, Transformations, verse 1. Among flowers, among trees, among coral, among animated creatures of other sorts, there are many different kinds. Among stars, among planets, among galaxies, among microbes, there are many different kinds. That's the way it is. In universe, between sunlight and sunclips, and beyond sunlight and sunclips, there are many different kinds. Verse 2. You and I know that. It's obvious. Imagine, though, if you will, a person who despises all flowers but one color of one kind. Maybe it is because he or she has a great experience of the oneness with, around, or because of the one kind, and thereupon forsakes all others, and thereupon sets out to destroy all others. Is this really useful? Yeah. No, it's not useful. Thanks for pointing that out, Dad. Um, there are many different kinds, right? And uh, yeah, it's not useful to go around trying to wipe out every kind except for your favorite kind. That's the approach that I'm coming from with this. There might be folks that are watching this that are like, you know, my kind of Buddhism quoting you, hypothetical you, not the real you. The, my kind of Buddhism is the real one, and other kinds of Buddhism are fake or false. And, okay, I'm not begrudging you the right to have your point of view. It's different from mine. I'm coming from the point of view that um, I find all of this useful on different levels, especially the teachings of Lord Buddha, which are behind me, which we do in eight out of the ten episodes. But I am interested in this, and I do hope one day to be able to really wrap my mind or whatever around these teachings. But for now, we're just kind of getting, 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 uh, jumping in the water. You know, what are, what are the teachings? Oh, here they are. Oh boy, I do want one day and hope one day, um, perhaps after absorbing some of this, to go spend some time and do a monastery stay in Mount, in Mount Khoisan at one of those 14 Shingon temples. 
Um, and by the way, uh, for people who are, uh, you know, longtime viewers and listeners of my other podcast, um, the Esoterra Nerd Podcast, you might be familiar with this music. And you might also be familiar with me giving a little thanks at the end of every episode of Esoteric Nerd Podcast to uh, uh, Susumu Ueda, Ueda and his father and the other monks at Jofuku Inn on Mount Koyasan. So one of the 14 temples on Shingon, the original Shingon temples on Mount Koyasan is Jofuku Inn. And one of the monks at that temple, or at least at the time of that recording, was the father of the musician who made that music. And the the monks that are chanting in that song are the monks at that monastery. So Shingon has always kind of been a part of what I'm putting out there into the world. Um, and uh, But this is the very first episode of anything I've done where I've really dove into Shingon specifically. Sorry for talking, to, if I'm talking too much. Um, a lot of this is pretty mind-blowing and I kind of have to like take a moment to absorb some of it. Okay. In exoteric Buddhism, the station of fruition... Oh, wait, okay. Buddha, Buddhahood is not ineffable. The second characteristic that distinguishes esoteric Buddhism from exoteric schools is the teaching that the fruition of Buddhahood can be described. So I think instead of the, 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 these are the five ways that Mahayana schools are different from each other. That, that's not what it is. It's the five ways that esoteric Buddhism is different from exoteric Buddhism. And then he gave five examples of Mahayana schools, specifically the, the Japanese Mahayana schools. Okay. One of them was Tendai, if I'm not mistaken, which is influenced by Shingon. And if I'm not mistaken, the founder was a student of Kobodayashi. So this is kind of get, gets a little little soap opera-y uh, times. He, was, he left and he was like, yeah, he was really into this whole master disciple thing and Kobodayashi was like, yeah, he doesn't respect the guru-disciple relationship and then the, they're the founders of two of the major Japanese Buddhism schools. Okay. Oh boy. Yes. So the second characteristic that distinguishes esoteric Buddhism from the exoteric schools is the teaching that the fruition of Buddha can be described. So esoteric says it can be described. Exoteric, in other words, Mahayana, regular B Buddhism, common, normal, more common, not common like commoner, like peasant, but common as in, you know, there's more of it. There's more Mahayana Buddhists than there are Shingon Buddhists or... Um, or uh, Theravada Buddhists. I don't know about the Vajrayana Buddhists because these days there's a lot of, um, of practitioners of Vajrayana Buddhism, the Tibetan variety, that are, are not Tibetan. And there are a lot who are Tibetan. So, But I think still Mahayana Buddhism takes the, the, uh, the prize for population. So what he's saying, or what Adrian is saying, is that Kukai says... That, um, that according to Shingon, it can be described. But according to Mahayana, there's a certain level that cannot be described. Okay, I'm, I'm down to hear his description. And then we'll let, I'll decide on my own and you can decide on your own whether the description is, is, is good, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, again, I apologize for like talking too much. It's just this is all very new to me and I'm having to process each thing that I read because I mean it's kind of you know it's very rare to, to read something that kind of blows your mind in every sentence. In exoteric Buddhism, the station of fruition, Buddhahood, is beyond words and transcends thought. That's in quotes. Because it lies within the formless void since words partake of the limitless form of the limitations of form they cannot describe what is formless and unlimited thus the avan the excuse me the avatar saka uh, teaches that the fruition division of the ocean nature is ineffable 
The fruition division, meaning Buddhahood, which is contrasted with the cause division, the division that contains all those who are still progressing to Buddhahood. The nature of the inner realization of Buddhahood, the fruition division, is as wide and deep as the ocean and is therefore indescribable. By contrast, the causal division of dependent origination is describable. The origination of the Buddha's preaching is dependent on the spiritual capacities of his hearers. That rings true, right? The Buddha's preaching describes that division of the Buddha's awakening that is describable in formal terms, that is, its causes. And he preaches this describable part of his realization by employing expedient means, right? That's the, the Lotus Sutra introduces that, right? Skillful means. So as to convey the doctrine in varying degrees of profundity and of proximation to truth that accord with the spiritual receptivity of his audiences. Kobodayashi says, okay, so that's all what Mahayana says, but Kobodayashi says, and he's kind of the Padmasambhava, you might say, it's not the same as Padmasambhava, but if there was a Padmasambhava of Japanese Vajrayana, it would be none other than Kobodayashi. But here's Kobodayashi, right? He has a, do a, a dorja in his hand, Vajra. A Kongo? I think that's what it's called. Kongoko in Japanese. And here's Padmasambhava. Also has the same instrument in his hand. Two different people. One came from what we now call Pakistan and went to Tibet later in life. Introduced the sutras to them. I mean, introduced the teachings. The other came from Japan to China and received the teachings from somebody and went back to Japan. So if you're like a racist or something, then you would say that one is better than the other. But presumably, like I said before, it was basically the same teachings Padmasambhava received from his teachers and passed on to his students in Tibet that Kobodayashi received from his teachers in China and passed on to his students in Japan. But if you, if you want to be closer to the source, then I guess Padmasambhava got the teachings from Nalanda University and introduced them to Tibet. And Kobodayashi got them from somebody who got them from somebody who got them from Nalanda University. So, ah, uh, but I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm putting them on the same level. I respect Kobodayashi as much. I'm going on record here. Um, I, I respect Kobodayashi as much as I respect Padmasambhava, at least. They are at least equal. Shocking, right? So, Kobodaya, when it says Kobo, so that's what Mahayana says, but on the other hand, Kobodayashi says, so that's kind of the reason I'm saying all that <clears throat> is to kind of point out what, the, what it means. That this is according to Kobodayashi means according to Vajrayana, because he was one guy who brought the Vajrayana teachings that he embodied within himself, as well as he had copies in his hand. And he brought those teachings to Japan, in the, and then Shingon came out of that one man. In a similar way, you might say, that at least in the beginning, Dogen embodied the teachings of Chan. And when he came to Japan, he was teaching Zen, which is the Japanese word for Chan, right? And the teachings of Zen were coming through one man, Dogen. So Dogen was to Zen at the time. There were other branches of Zen and other founders of other sects of Zen. Uh, where Shingon, uh, the same can't really be said. Um, there's one founder of the one form of Japanese Vajrayana, as far as I know. Comment below if there's another Japanese Vajrayana that comes from a different line unrelated to Kobodayashi. Okay. So, Kobodayashi says, in other words, Japanese Vajrayana says, right? <clears throat> Sorry. Says that the esoteric doctrine 
preached by Mahavirokana is not an expedient doctrine, not a skillful means thing, right? Which only approximates to truth, but the truth itself. The Tathagata is able to preach the truth in a formal mode since forms and Buddhahood are non-dual. The formal dharmas interpenetrate suchness. Therefore, whereas the exoteric doctrines are only expedient and approximate teachings concerning the causal division of dependent origination that can be described, the content of the esoteric doctrine is precisely the fruition division of the ineffable ocean nature. Kobodayashi says that when mm, something my eyes won't focus on because it's in italics and it's phonetic and has a lot of accents and things, I think it's a, an approximation of Sanskrit. Tasa bumi vyakhyana and shakuran, <clears throat> when those two speak of the different spiritual capacities of those who hear the doctrine. And when the ancient Yogacara, that's an interesting subject that I'll talk about another time, and Madhyamaka texts speak of what is ineffable and beyond thought, they are speaking from the point of view of the unenlightened. Now that's a statement. Mm -hmm. So take that, Nagarjuna. Sorry. That is of those who are still in the causal position. For such people, the truth is indeed ineffable, since they have had no direct experience or knowledge of it. Oh, sick burn, Kowadayashi or Adrian, approximating the sentiment of what Kowadayashi would say. I assume, I don't know, this isn't a direct translation of anything as far as I know. Okay and are therefore unable to describe it. Yeah, how could you describe a place where you've never been? Hmm. Burn. At the level of Buddhahood, however, there is a complete interpenetration of word and mind. And the Buddha, in his Dharma body of form, is able to describe exactly the nature of his realization. I'm going to stop reading there for today. And I must say, it sounds similar to other things that I've heard in reference to Vajrayana Buddhism, but I have not, as far as I can recollect, gotten to any of the teachings which are so precious. In other words, there's a lot of buildup, a lot of buildup, a lot of buildup. If you've read the Lotus Sutra, it goes on and 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 on with buildup about how important this Lotus Sutra thing is going to be. And then you get to it. That's all I have to say about that right now. But it seems that it began a tradition, I am guessing, that uh, was, was carried forward in, uh, in Vajrayana, which is to do a whole lot of buildup, a lot of, lot of, lot of trailers, a lot of uh, PR, a lot of, uh, you know, dun dun dun, opening credits, dun dun dun, dun dun dun, dun. here comes the teachings, here comes the teachings. I, I, again, I've been a student of Vajrayana under my father for my whole life, and I have yet to get to the teachings. No, my dad taught me a few things. But I'm, I, I, I would like to one day verify or uh you know hear something in reference to the teaching that he taught me to find out if they were even from vajrayana or just something someone made up and passed on to his guru i don't know it's that kind of thing um and there is a lot of emphasis on secrecy so who knows we might read this whole book and only learn that you should find a true teacher of the true teachings and he'll tell you secretly after you take an oath of secrecy and that would be disappointing 
I hope that there's uh, something, some reference to these teachings that are so ineffable or effable. They're effable even though the Mahayanas say they're ineffable. I'm not making fun of this. I am impressed. I, I dig it. And I'm glad that we're only going to do this one out of every 10 episodes because I, I, I don't want to get kind of carried away. And I look forward to next episode, 216, where we'll get back to the Mahavaga and find out what situations came up in which Lord Buddha, the real one, Shakyamuni Buddha, had to establish rules of order for how the monks should behave because we're at a point in time with this before he started teaching nuns. So, uh, But we did read the rules for nuns already. If you're interested in all that, I recommend uh, Tibitaka. Click there. And... Uh, and you can join me on my slow journey to lay the foundation so that perhaps, maybe, one day, that all is going to make sense. And, and I'll meet you on the other side. If that even makes any sense, because I don't know, because I, I, I don't know. I'm still laying the foundation. Brick by brick. But that's apparently what the top of one of the towers looks like, according to Kobo Dayashi. Okay, I mean, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I, I did. And, um, and uh, yeah, like I said, I look forward to next time. And uh, I'll put a link in the description below if you were particularly drawn to that um, recital the brief recital I did of a couple of verses of one of the chapters of my dad's book, Transformations, which he wrote in 1976. You can get yourself a copy of that. It's available on Kindle. It's also available in paperback. It's about $5. And, um, okay. Until next time, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do the closing that my dad taught me that we used to do at the end of our, our uh, Vajrayana chanting in the morning that we would do. Okay. I do have a, a recording of that as well. And um, perhaps I will do something with that, make that available here on the Buddhist Books Podcast in some form. In fact, I'll just go ahead and, uh, and play it now.
to the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, to the spirits of life among us and to the spirits below. We send out our reverent love and compassion. May all beings be happy. May all beings be serene. May all beings be in peace.